Hello and welcome to the Faces of Africa Pocket Edition, where we dissect and discuss the topics covered in our weekly documentary show, which takes you through the continent's history, cultures and major issues through exploring great personalities. This week on Faces of Africa podcast, we're still talking about climate change, specifically water shortage in South Africa and the impact that climate has had around the continent. My name is Fatia Mohamed Noor and I'm joined by Thuku Karaoke. He's a journalist and a climate activist. I want to go back to the 2018 Day Zero campaign that was happening in South Africa. In Cape Town, there was a possibility that it was about to uh, run out of water. Now we're seeing the same situation almost happening again in Hotang province in South Africa. What do you make of that? You know, uh, one of the things you can pick from that is because uh, the existing infrastructure that we have in most cities in Africa is not uh, meant to cater for the populations that are there right now. So when our population increase, we don't uh, we, we don't up or we don't increase or improve the infrastructures that are supposed to, you know, serve a certain number of people. And therefore, if uh, we, we, you are planned for let's say five million people, and in the next four of years you have like ten million people coming in, mm-hmm. that means that you, the infrastructure that is existing is not able to serve those people. And the other thing is that uh, because of our climate change, like everyone knows, is uh, that we are losing water in alarming rates. And then uh, again, we are not able to sustain, especially our serving dams. You know, in m- most cities in Africa are served by big dams over time to serve certain populations, in, uh, especially in cities. Mm-hmm. But when the water evaporates more than is expected, that means that uh, there are going to be a shortage of water every other time. So what we are seeing uh, happen uh, in Wateng in South Africa over the years, and, uh, and I think it's an issue that has happened over the last 15 years, mm-hmm. is that uh, the, 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 there has been a uh, very poor management of the existing infrastructure. That is one thing. But again, there needs to, there, there's a need to also look for extra sources of water to serve the populations that are increasing in, 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 in that city and in other cities in Africa. Mm-hmm. And also, when you go back to the issue of planning, are we planning for the future infrastructure or are we just planning as as we are? So those things will uh, go hard in hard, whereby we need to manage our environment better because uh, we need to be, it needs to be sustainable. And also we need to make sure that uh, our planning infrastructure is, is uh, sustainable to the increasing populations. Right. Away from the governance perspective, even as a journalist, do you think then we're telling enough stories around the continent when it comes to environment? Yes, we do have these issues, but are we really telling the stories as African journalists? I, I feel, personally, I feel strongly that uh, there have been an effort by many journalists to like really come up and uh, tell the stories in a, in a, in a better way than it, used to, than it used to happen before. But again, you remember there is the issue of resources and uh, who and how people are able to reach to the sources or uh, to the sources of the stories, and again spread those stories across to the people who are supposed to hear them. So journalism cannot operate in a vacuum. Journalism must be heavily funded for the stories to be told. Because I always uh, feel like when I tell a story, for it to make an impact, it has to go to the people. So uh, there must be there must be a very very good working uh, relationship bet- between those people who are really in the environment space, and also between them and gen- journalists. W- one of the problems that uh, I think most of the environment uh, and climate storytellers like myself are facing and have yeah. faced over time is the lack of access to the really information. Sometimes the experts are, are so busy or <laughs> behaving so busy. I don't know. So if you don't, you know, for a journalist, I'm, I'm a journalist who is a, an enthusiast of environment and climate change, but I cannot be an expert. And if I want to be an expert, it takes me time to, to be an expert. Yeah. So what happens uh, and what I feel happens is there is a disconnect. There is a distance between the knowledge that journalists have and the experts who have the knowledge that is supposed to be spread to the people. And that gap uh, makes uh, it difficult for sometimes, and, and in most cases, for journalists to pass the real impactful message mm-hmm. to the people that they, they need to, they, they, they want to speak to. I know you're organizing a film festival, the Green Film yeah. Festival. This is in line with the environment. How's that going? Yeah. And what are some of the stories that you're hoping would be featured in the festival? We felt like there is a need for people who are telling the stories to be exposed more, and also 
uh, to organize like a meeting point between uh, conservationists, between environmentalists, between experts, between communication experts as well, so that those people can join in and tell each other how do you want our story told and how can we tell our, your story better than you even think. So most of the stories that we are aiming to have uh, especially on uh, you know landscape and biodiversity management, whereby especially the issue of uh, you know agroforestry about, about uh, you know conservation, agriculture, and all that, so that we can try to help for uh, environmentalists and people who are in the field of environment mm -hmm. to know how their stories can be told better, and also for the storytellers to understand what exactly the the people are doing in that field and also decide how their stories could be told better than they are being told. So we are looking forward to see a lot of stories on uh, the issue of, uh, you know, landscape management, you know, uh, how to care about, uh, how to care for, for rivers, for wetlands, for swamps and all that. And also on the issue of uh, wildlife uh, conservation, because again, that is one of the areas that we have seen that is uh, also being affected a lot because of settlements, because of uh, human population increase. So it, it's more or less, telling the success stories of people who are picking up the disadvantages that are happening around our environment and converting them to opportunities to, uh, one, save the environment and also create a, a, a good environment for people to do. Yeah. As we wrap up, I'd just like to know maybe your thoughts as an African, not even as a journalist, but as an African, what you'd like to see the continent to be when it comes to environment and climate change in the next few years? I want to see a better Africa. I want to see a less suffering Africa because like right like now, yeah. we're already talking about uh, a drought-stricken part of Africa and a water shortage uh, affected part of Africa. But can there be a better way of management of resources, both from uh, you know the political side and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and the, the political side in our countries, and also from the resource side, on how uh, projects on environmental finance around the world can it be harmonized mm -hmm. so that Africa is not disadvantaged. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Thuku, for joining us on the podcast. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Asante sana. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Fatia Mohamed Noor. Remember, you can watch this documentary on our CGTN platforms on Sunday. It runs live at 12.30 East Africa time, 17.30 Beijing time, and 9.30 GMT. On Monday, it will be uploaded on 